And I would like to give you a bit of an overview of the molecular and genetics tools that we use in the biosecurity space. So what I'm going to talk about is quite a big area of research that has been done over many years and there are a number of people that have been involved in that before and um, also a number of different institutes that I just would like to acknowledge before I start. Um, so when we talk about associated organisms, I first want to clarify what I mean by associated organisms. So they are organisms that live together with others often as symbionts or as passive pathogens, and they can live on the surface, on plants for example, or even inside the plant, or in any other organisms that we know. You are probably aware of, about our gut microbiome, so there are billions of bacteria that live in our gut and they help us to be healthy, but there are also some that can be pathogenic. And the same is the case in any other environment where you have plants and uh, herbivores or carnivores interacting with each other, and those associated organisms can then be transferred from one to the other via vectors, and can cause all sorts of effects, positive or negative ones. So it is important when we're talking about biocontrol agents and testing them for release that we also assess if they have any of those associated organisms that might be pathogenic. So we want to make sure that they are clean of those and often what people do is to rear them in captivity to uh, get rid of all, all those pathogens. Um, there should be a risk and benefit assessment to see how big a problem they are or if they pose a problem at all. And of course we also have a scientific interest because we just want to see how they interact and what these mechanisms are. And um, one of the ways to detect them is by molecular detection, and that's especially important for organisms that you can't just see or you can't grow them on a petri dish. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about those methods by using an example. And um, so before I start that, I just want to explain as well what molecular detection actually means. So it is a set of molecular technical diagnostics methods that we can apply to specimen. And um, we are looking at biological markers, either in the DNA, which is more common, but also in the RNA or in the proteins of those organisms. And um, um, by looking at specific markers, we can then identify what organism we are looking at what's the genus, what is the species, or sometimes even what is the subspecies or the genotype, which can be quite important because even though species belong to the same genus, they can have very different uh, phenotypes and behave very differently, and even the genotype can determine um, how they interact with other organisms. And um, as I mentioned before, it's important to detect organisms that you can't culture, so in those cases, it is detrimental that you look at the DNA and um, identify that way. And you can also use those methods to quantify and to monitor those organisms, how they behave in the environment and in certain interacting uh, systems. So the example I'm going to talk about is a bacterium that's called Candidatus library bacter europaeus, or I refer to as LOI, it's shorter. Um, Bacteria that belong to the genus Candidatus library vector are vectored by psyllids. So those insects that you see here, they feed on the phloem of plants and by doing this they take up the bacteria and transport them to, the, to another plant and uh, spread the disease or if it's sp spread the bacterium. Some of them uh, are pathogenic but some are also asymptomatic, for example Loy was found in <coughs> Italian pear trees and it didn't cause any disease in there. But there are other species in this genus that can call, cause the um, citrus greening or potato chip disease. And um, <coughs> in 2011, there were researchers from Plant and Food who worked on those pathogenic uh, strains. And they saw that in the area around their trial site, uh, there were broom plants that showed, showed similar disease symptoms you see here on the right side. 
and they didn't know what it was and that's how all this research started. So they suspected that it might be a library vector, but they weren't sure. So in order to talk a bit more about the methods, I decided to start with the results first. <laughs> and I can tell you now that we found out, that's a bit rearranged, I'm sorry. Um, we found out that the library vector that they found in those plants was actually LOI, the Europeus, that was found in Pear in Italy before, and that it was introduced into New Zealand from the UK. So when the early settlers came to New Zealand, the Scotch broom was also brought with it, and that should only be on this side, that it was a native plant in the UK and then turned into an invasive weed in New Zealand. And in 1993, the broom psyllid, which also comes from the UK, was introduced to New Zealand as a biological control agent. <coughs> at that time, um, of course, the agent underwent all the necessary tests, but at that time, the library vector weren't known because they were unculturable and no one had detected them before. So what we found that uh, the psyllid actually brought this library vector species from the UK and then um, established in New Zealand, and it's actually quite widespread in New Zealand, but we only found it established in broom plants and in the broom psyllids. And we did not find any other library vector species in those broom plants. And they were transmitted via the psyllids and also via the broom seeds. But today it's still unclear or it's unconfirmed if they actually cause these disease symptoms that were found in the broom plants. So at the moment, it actually looks more like the psyllids cause those symptoms and not the library vector. Right, and now I'm going to talk you a little bit through the methods that we used in order to get to those results. So first, of course, it was important to identify what bacteria we're talking about, what is the species. And because uh, those researchers who worked on other library vector species suspected that it was a bacterium in this genus, we could um, look at a gene in, that's found in bacteria, it's called 16S ribosomal RNA gene, and that <coughs> encodes for a prokaryotic part of the ribosome. And it's very useful for this sort of analysis because it has uh, conserved regions, but also highly variable regions in the gene. And if you use some sort of anchors that we call primers, you can then amplify this whole region and sequence it and compare it to the other species that are already published to find out what it actually is. So because uh, there had been some research done on other, other library vector species, we could use primers that target all the library vector species and amplify it from those samples that were uh, that showed disease symptoms, the broom and the psyllids. And we could amplify this region and compare it to the other species and we found I'm not sure if you can see that. Uh, we found that the library back that was found in New Zealand was identical to the one in the UK. That's the first two lines. It had only a couple of differences in the sequence to uh, the strain that was found in Italy. So it was another LOI, another European strain, uh, species. And it had quite a number of differences to the other species that caused those diseases in potato and tomato, for example. So that was good to figure out what we're actually talking about. And the next thing that we could do was to look um, at the whole bacterial community in those samples. To do that, you can use um, primers that don't only target the library vector genus, but also all the other bacteria that are in the sample. So there are many different species of bacteria that live in any biological system and especially in the plants as well. And by targeting that, you amplify a whole range of different um, bacterial DNA. So we had 171 samples of plant and seeds that we analyzed. And um, if you want to sequence all those uh, amplified fragments, you actually need to do some massive parallel sequencing or next generation sequencing. And then we had to analyze 20 million reads. And so you need some bioinformatic tools to analyze those samples. 
And what we found here was that, um, that's the code for the different colors. So in the UK, we found about 12% uh, library vector in the samples on average. In Southland and New Zealand, we found 2.5. In Lincoln, 0.5. And interestingly, in Northlands, in New Zealand, we didn't find any library vector species or <coughs> sequence at all. And that is interesting because the psyllid has never been released in Northlands. So that was a good indication that the library vector is actually transferred via the psyllid. The other advantage is that uh, this method is um, less biased than other methods because you're not just looking at one specific uh, genus of bacteria, but all of them, and you can also get a good indication of th all those other bacteria that are found in the sample, which can be interesting to analyze how they interact with, with each other. <coughs> so now that we knew that, oh sorry, I didn't mention that, um, by looking at all those individual sequences, those millions that we got, we also saw that there was definitely no other library vector species in those samples, but just the European strain. Because we knew that, we could then simplify the method a little bit by using a PCR detection which shows you the presence or the absence only. And that means you don't have to sequence it, it is faster and it is cheaper. So based on those sequences that we had, we could then develop primers that only target this one species. And then you can see here only the ones that had that were infected with library back to Europeans showed those bands here. In the first line, it's just a standard. And that is a plant DNA control just to show that the DNA um, was amplified and good quality. And by doing that, we confirmed again that the samples in Northlands were all negative. We could not detect it in there. And um, similar to that, you can also design a quantitative PCR approach where you measure how much DNA you have in relation to the plant DNA. And that is good to quantify it, to track it over time, and is a quite a low detection limit. So we went down to five copies of DNA in the samples that we could detect. So using all those different methods and combining the results, we actually looked at um, the whole range of the spread in New Zealand to see how the library vector was spread in New Zealand. And we went, we analyzed samples from 52 sites from Northland down to Southland. And we wanted to see how specific this infection actually is. Does it only affect broom or does it affect other plants as well? So we looked at uh, closely, closely related legumes and also some New Zealand natives that we were concerned about. And we found that in those three regions, library vector was present in the plants. And that we only found it in broom plants as an established infec in infection. We did find one kofi tree and I think four gorse bushes that had library vector in them, but it was not an established infection. It was just very localized and very rare occurrence. And why that is, I will talk about in a minute. So then we looked also at how the library vector can be transmitted from one plant to the other. There can be different vectors. I said psyllids are the main, one, main ones, but there are also psyllids from other plants, the others that I mentioned before. And it could also be transmitted by cutting, growing plants from cuttings or from grafting. And we found that in these regions, we found uh, room psyllids that had library vector infection. And that correlates pretty much with the, uh, with the plants as well. And here again, we found a couple of co-5 psyllids that also had library vector. But um, those this one tree and the co-5 psyllids, they were all in an area where there were a lot of um, infected broom plants growing all around and they had been growing next to each other for over 20 years and this infection in the co was not established. So what we think what happens is that the broom psyllid or the co-5 psyllid fly to the other plant, probe on it, 
see if they want to feed on it or not and then come back, but the library vector doesn't actually infect the, the population of the other plants. Um, yeah, so also again, very interesting here that in Northland we did not find any library vector and we didn't find any solids, as I mentioned before. Confirming again this thought that the library vector is transmitted by the psyllids. Um Also what was interesting was that uh, plants we grew in the greenhouse from seeds to seedlings didn't show any disease symptoms and there were no psyllids in the greenhouse. So as I mentioned before, it is more likely that the psyllids actually cause the disease symptoms and not the library vector. And when we compared plants that we found in the field that looked sick or healthy, there was again no correlation with infection. So as a summary, um, it is important that you keep up to date with the newest developments of what can be detected and that you constantly update those risk assessment or testing protocols in order to detect what you can. It's never 100%, but <coughs> at least you have to try to get as much as possible. Um, associated organisms do play an important role in any interaction in the environment. And um, as I said, they can be beneficial or pathogenic. There are genetic tools there and they are needed to detect some of the associated organisms that you can't detect otherwise. And molecular tools are essential to actually identify the species or down to the genus level, which you often can't by just looking at an organism. And yeah, there are a range of methods available that can be used for, yeah, depending on what needs there. Right, any questions? Thank you.